My name is Alan, and you are watching the Sound Speeds Podcast, episode 10, just like a little butterfly right there. Welcome to January 1st, 2020. I would say that hindsight is 2020, but it's not. That's all ahead of us. Hindsight is 2019, but you don't need me to tell you that, do you? You know how to do your math. You're a smart person. That's why you're watching and hopefully listening to this podcast. Now, I know it's been a while since we've done an episode, and for good reason. I've been kind of collapsing, or I should say, kind of coming together and calculating some information on what I'm going to be doing for the future of this podcast. I have been thinking about it. I've been looking looking at the metrics, and I know it's been since before Thanksgiving since I've done one of these. But I have some information about the future of this podcast, and I'll go into that at the end of this video. But for right now, hopefully you'll enjoy it because I've been gone for a little bit, and I'm going to kind of give you a few extra little tidbits throughout this episode. So without further delay, let's get into it. Amazon Impulse Buys. Just like there are two 20s in the year 2020, I'm going to be showing you two products in this video. And part of it's because I think they're both really cool and couldn't figure out which one I wanted to share with you more. But the other reason is because I felt like you might want to start off 2020 with a couple of cool things to add to whatever you're doing. Now, for the people that are on set, if you know me outside in the real world, you know that for the past few years, I've been hiding from the sun. My skin naturally absorbs the sun, which a lot of people completely hate because I get very deep tans really, really quickly. But I hate that. I don't like the sun to just sit there and melt away at my skin. I don't like wearing sunscreen. I hate wearing bug spray and that kind of thing. So I don't like to put things on my skin when I'm outside. It's not because I'm allergic or any of that kind of stuff. It's just because I don't like doing it. So what I started doing years and years ago was hiding from the sun. I started wearing various different forms of, of protection, blocking out the sun from like big wide brim hats. Then I started to kind of, um, someone showed me that if you actually cover up your skin with like a long sleeve shirt, it protects the sun. And there are shirts that, that are SPF 50, for example. So it keeps the sun off of you and still breathes really well. So I started to actually get deeper and deeper into this hiding from the sun thing. And at this point, I've actually done really well at doing so. But one of the things that has always bothered me was that if I'm doing any kind of day exterior work, I would always have to wear a long sleeve shirt. And if I go inside to do indoor stuff, I usually like to wear short sleeve shirts. Even in the winter, I will be wearing shorts and a t-shirt if we're on the stage all day. I don't care if it's 20 degrees, 10 degrees or whatever, I'm gonna be doing that. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not gonna have a change of clothes with me. I'm gonna definitely do that because I like to be prepared. But I don't wanna end up wearing all this extra stuff on me if I'm not gonna be using it or needing to be wearing all of it. So what I have come to do is I will wear short sleeve shirts, but I will be wearing a sun hoodie over it. Believe it or not, this right here is made by the Columbia company. It's called PFG, Professional Fishing Gear. And when you put this thing on, it's SPF 50. It's extremely lightweight, but it has a hood built into it. So you can pull it up. It protects your neck. So if you wear a wide brim hat or something like that, then this protects your neck, which a lot of shirts don't do. I can wear my headphones on over them. I could still hear through them just fine. And it's it goes over great. I can put a face guard up in front and cover up my face, which is something I personally like to do because it hides me from the sun. And I can wear sun sun uh sunglasses or something like that over it and because this is very low profile and the whole thing is extremely lightweight who can't carry something this small with them it's extremely small it's very lightweight like i said spf 50 i personally love it and because it's black it does great and as soon as I'm done with it, I hang it up so it completely air dries out by the next day. I love these things. There is a link down in the description if you'd like to check it out. The other thing is not for the person on set. It is for the YouTuber. Now, I have been no I've known about this product for about a year and a half. When I was working for Michael Wynn, who has the Michael Wynn YouTube channel, he on his uh, set cart at work, or I should say his utility cart, he has one of these lights. Now, this is, what is it called? A Yang, Yang Yu, Yang Nuo, something like that. And it's a model 
YN360. I do have a battery on there that does not come with the light. It comes as just a regular light for like $76. And it does have a quarter 20 thread on the bottom. It has you do need to plug it in. And it has a really weird thing where you have to either plug it in or connect up a battery. You can't do both at the same time. You can't charge while it's on there. But I think the upgraded model, like the Mark III or whatever the newer version is, you can. Now, what makes this light really, really cool? The features it has on the back. For example, you turn the thing on and it goes zero up to 100 or 99 actually. But then it also has a fine mode so you can dial in on exactly where you want it to be. Now, currently, I have it in 5500K, uh, which is outdoor lighting. Uh, if, if I have it set to outdoor lighting, you can see what it's doing to my background right there. Now, if I want to dial in on exactly where I want it to, I could kill it all the way, bring up 3200 degree lighting. So if I'm lighting for something inside, it's going to dial in on exactly if I want. Now, now I can also go part of the way, sorry to pop the microphone there, and then I can go up on 55K so I can get the exact look I want. And as if that isn't cool enough, I'm going to go all the way down on those for a second. And I'm going to go over here to RGB where you can adjust the red level, the green level, and the blue level to whatever you want. You can you can dial them in. It's not a color wheel or anything. I don't think this particular model has an app. I don't use it because I don't care anything about it. But you can dial in on the exact color value you want, which is really awesome. And because you can see physically on the on the number right there what you like, you can get the exact color you want. This yellow color is one that I used to troll Rachel, who is in, in the sound department with me on P Valley, which is going to be coming out in a couple of months on stars. Sorry to keep popping the microphone. I'm facing right at it. Um, but this this color here, she hated. <laughs> I used to always change this. She would she would change it to a color she liked, like usually pink. And I would usually dial in real quickly on the colors that I wanted it to be because I'm a troll. And I I would just I would set it to usually she hated, what was it? She hated it if it was all the way red. So I would go blast it all the way up to there. Or what was it? 60, uh, what was it? Not that one. I can't remember exactly what it was anymore. But it was it was really funny because I would dial in on this yellow, what she referred to as a pute color. She hated her car to be that color. But anyway, it also has different batteries. Uh, you, could, you could jump to battery. Um, uh, which is it's automatically on there right now. And the battery that I'm using on it, I think is one of the better ones. And I think I got two of them for something like $23, something like that. And these are long lasting. I was actually using these lights, sorry, using these lights last night. There was one of them. I bought two of them. But I was using just one of them last night for over three hours at almost full blast because I was using it as a bounce. And it never once ran out, Never, and nor did it... Uh, run out or uh, of, of juice or waver start to fade any of that kind of stuff so this young you light young nuo light the yn 360 is really awesome i have links down in the description if you'd like to check that out and for you youtubers out there it is a one-stop shop you can get the cables the charging cables you can get the batteries and everything for one light and you have to have a backup light for about a hundred dollars and considering what it does oh i forgot to mention this also it has like this this filter on the front too that you can also whoops got to do it that way but it's it's magnetic you can just you know slot it around the back and it stores itself and so you can add this on there if you want it to be a little bit more diffuse and it doesn't change the light a whole lot it does make it a little bit more amber but it's also really cool so this whole entire thing you can mount from a c stand you can uh you can stand up someplace, but this light right here is extremely cool. And you can throw some wax paper on there. You can throw, you know, gels on there if you want to. But I highly recommend it. And it even, it comes with this little, you know, case too. So if you want to pick this up, it, there's links down in the description if you'd like to check it out. The batteries charge up quickly. And uh, personally, I've been meaning to get some of these for a long time. And finally made the jump and bought quite a bit of gear that I've been meeting to. So links down in the description to both the hoodie and to the light if you'd like to check them out. Something Sound. A few episodes back, I reviewed and showcased the Monster Earbuds. Now, I will say those I loved. I gave them a 5 out of 5 star rating and they have held up great over time. And I do know what the reason is that it stays lit up when you put them back on the little, uh, when you put it back in the case. 
it's because it's charging. The case itself has an internal battery and it shows uh, a blue. So that way you know that it's charging. So that I didn't understand what it was because I didn't bother reading the manual or anything. But those little earbuds, when you're wearing them, they're actually using the battery, obviously. When you put them back in the case, they start charging off of the case. And the, ch the case can fully charge them, I think, two or so times. And I use these for Disney when I went to Disney over the, the Thanksgiving holiday. And I will say they were very impressive. I really like the sound of them. They plug up the ear nicely, but not overly much. They have a great fidelity to them. They are great. They have a great DSP. They're quiet when you hit pause. They turn on. They're not overly bassy. Just I really like them a whole lot. And I cannot speak highly enough about them, especially for the price point. So based on that review, and showcase monster asked me if i would like to try out their bluetooth speaker and of course i said yes how could i say no after that wonderful pair of earbuds now full disclosure monster did send me this in exchange for a fair review i get to keep it afterwards but i'm not going to let it to affect my opinion so you can expect this to be a fair and honest review now that said i will tell you this i don't think this is a five-star product i will kind of go over it a little bit with you the reason why, and, and just so we're, we're, we're straight here, there are links down in the description if you'd like to check it out. This is the Monster Superstar S310 Pure Monster Sound Bluetooth Speaker. The reason I say this is not a five-star product is, first of all, the sound quality. If you were to connect this up, and I'll, I'll do it here in a second. If you connect it up, there's a few things you're going to notice. Number one is that the fidelity of this mic uh, the, of the the speaker you would expect it to be since it's a round speaker 360 there's only one access that that speaker is in full fidelity because the speakers face out from here and here and if you slightly go off access a little bit to it it doesn't really seem to fill the air the same way i've had other bluetooth speakers and i do own other bluetooth speakers that fill up the air a lot better even at any distance all around you another thing is if you lay this down it kind of depending on how you put it if you put it on a hard surface there's no dents or dimples or anything that hold it in that right position so when you put it down it may roll to a position you don't care anything about and it's not going to sound good there the sound quality itself the bass is nice and punchy but the mids and highs it kind of even when it's not full volume it kind of squeaks a little bit at the mids and highs now it could be a defective model it could be a defective you know actual speaker but i don't know and i don't know that for certain what i can tell you is this particular version that i have it squeaks a little bit it doesn't sound exactly right and it's very noticeable. It's not like a little subtle thing. It's one of those things where I want to put it on. I was like, well, geez, am I not listening? Because what I always do is I put a, a song that I know. I used to go to YouTube. I find a video I like, and I'm usually into it. And I say, oh, that's cool. Well, I thought maybe this didn't make a good connection. Maybe it just was a bad recording, and it was hearing stuff that just – you know, it was hearing so deeply into the music that I was able to pick out things. You know how when you watch a 4K television and you watch something in 1080p, it doesn't look as good typically as it does if you watch something 1080p. And the reason why is because it exceeds the, the, the quality of it. And sometimes you can see pixels and stuff that you wouldn't normally see otherwise. I was thinking maybe this was the same way, but it's not. Sadly, it kind of distorts a little bit. It kind of it almost like sounds like that. I don't want to say tweeter is blown, but when you know how, if you start to raise up your volume, how it kind of like almost gives out and goes, eh, you know, squeaks at the high part where it kind of gives out where, I mean, but it doesn't matter if it's a lower volume or a higher volume. It always does the same thing. Now, again, the bass is punchy, but that's not enough to really carry it to me. It's not one of those things that really stands out as being outstanding. Now, I can stand the, the speaker down on a table and it's vertical, but then you lose all stereo aspect of it. I mean, you need it to be horizontal because your ears are horizontal. That's how you have stereo, you know, the ability to hear in stereo, left and right ears. And if I go vertical, then it becomes basically mono. So there's no real point in that. Another thing that really drives me crazy about Bluetooth speakers is when they're overly talkative. So if I were to start this thing up, it has to do its whole. Oh, Tinkerbell has come to visit. All right, let's see if we can connect this thing up and we'll do a live demonstration. Oh, did it connect? 
I can't tell if it did or not because I'm in the wrong screen. I'm going there now. It says device connected. Okay, so I'm going to play something not too loud, but I'm going to play the sound speeds music. Let's see how this does. Okay, so you can see how if I turn it away, why'd you stop? Oh, that's my phone. Why did you stop? See, it's off axis. That's on axis. I don't know if you can hear that. It's distorting a little bit in the highs. It's probably not picking up great through here because in all honesty, it's not up overly loud. I'm shooting this at 1 a.m. And my wife is probably going to be texting me momentarily saying, why are you playing music? It's so loud because the kids are there. Now, it does get fairly loud. But when you get it overly loud, what does it do? It distorts even more. So the mids and highs distort even more at the higher volume. So what do I say about this? Let me turn it off. Let's see what Tinkerbell mode. Great. So what do I think about this product? If it turned on and just went bing or something like that, which most Bluetooth headphones or rather speakers don't do, I wish they would stop being so talkative. They always have to make noise and indicate you're going up in volume and lower in volume and whatever. Oh, I forgot to demonstrate this also. Here, geez, let me go ahead and do it real quick. Okay, yet again, I'm gonna take the volume down. Okay, Tinkerbell, you're connected. Volume down. When have I achieved the bottom possible volume? We do not know because it does not indicate it. Just like, Okay, I'm playing my video. I can slowly start going up. It's barely up now. I mean, if you know my theme song, you can hear that it's slightly distorted at the top. So let me actually fast forward a bit and I'm gonna see if I can find one of my other episodes real quick. And let's hear line level input i have no level line level is much hotter input so why wouldn't it work that's a good question but i think you're confusing what you hear that noise mic in line level actually is that's not on my podcast doing. microphone levels are very very low voltage output device so if you go all the way down there is no volume to, to, uh, there's no noise or indicator that tells you that you've gone all the way down in volume just like if you go all the way up to the top, it does not indicate with a ding or something like that that you've gotten to the very, very top, like many Bluetooth speakers do. So I've kind of become accustomed to that. And I don't normally like that, but I will say that it comes in handy if it's a little subtle thing. But that is not. That is, I guess you could say that is actually more than subtle because it is completely non-existent. It does connect up fairly quickly to your uh, Bluetooth speaker. It does have a nice feel to it. I mean, it is sturdy and um, there is a little charging port here on the back. So uh, if you have fingernails, which I do not currently, you could get in there fairly quickly, which uh, let me, I will not bother doing, I guess, but it will, um, it does actually get in there. I just, I literally just got through chopping off every one of my fingernails. So <laughs> I should almost get uh, get something and stop the stop this and edit it, but I'm not going to. Um, so if you normally you know bite your fingernails or something like that, you may have a hard time getting into it. So you might want to use something. Oh, look, tweezers. So I'll just I'll dig into this. And okay, you also have a micro SD card that can fit in here. So if you want to play music off of that too, you can do that as well. It is heavy duty. It is not waterproof, I don't believe. So I wouldn't throw this thing in the water. Um, and um, it is currently, at the time of this video, going for $60 with a $10 off coupon, 15% off, it says online. What, is that, what does that say? Uh, it says Bluetooth speaker, how many? Oh, 400 milliamp hour battery, 3.7 volts, 5 volts, uh, 0.8 amps. It doesn't say anything about the wattage. But if you have any interest in getting what I would give a good solid 3 out of 5 stars, not overly impressed. I mean, I, I honestly, I might go up to three and a half stars. But if I had to go up to four or down to three, 
then I would say go down to three. So I would probably review this on Amazon and give it a good, I, I, I guess I would actually say three and a half stars because I've tried some three products and the price isn't terrible. If you're far enough away, I mean, it, the base does carry. And as long as you get in the right position, I just don't think it's fully thought out. But I mean, I'd say a good solid three, three and a half stars. So if you have any interest, it is a link down in the description below if you'd like to check it out. Now, before we go on to segment number three, I do want to add a couple of things here. I do have a Teespring store for sound speeds. I just started it up recently. And until I get 10,000 subscribers, which I'm, I'm almost halfway to there. Um, but if um, uh, the estimations of Social Blade are accurate, I should hit it later this year, which I don't think that's going to be accurate because I don't think I can double the amount of subscribers I have on sound speeds in one year. But we will see, I guess. Um, but regardless, there is a Teespring store if you'd like to buy some swag that has sound speeds on, on there. So it's the same kind of logo as you see here, but the shirts are basically dirt cheap. What I've done is I mean, a lot of people online sell them for $22, $23. I'm not going to do that. I'm more about getting my brand out there than, and, and, you know, saying show your support than, you know, price gouging. It. And so, like, if a shirt is like, $11.90 to produce, I'm going to round it up to 12. If it's 1320, I'm going to round it up to probably what is it? 1350. So it's only a few cents. I don't ever take it over a dollar. I think uh, most of them were in the top parts of like it was like around like 1190, 1170 something like that. So I only went up a few cents. But nothing is over a dollar in profit or anything. So, because I'm more about getting my brand out there. If you have any interest, the Teespring store is mentioned in the comments below or the description below, I should say. And also, one more note going forward in this episode, I'm going to be pitch dark with just the logo up there. You're going to see in a second, but I'm going to see if doing this voice only has any effect on the viewership. I know what the numbers look like for the previous nine episodes, so I'm going to check that out. So this is the last time you're going to see my smiling face in this episode. Hope you stay tuned. Segment three coming up. Opinionated much? One of the questions I've been asked every now and then is why don't I do more reviews of products? Well, the reason why is because I don't find them to be all that easy in all honesty. It's not because I'm not good at picking apart audio gear. Believe me, I am extremely opinionated, have no problem sharing my thoughts on something, and I do love tearing apart things and really figuring them out. Not to the point where I will physically unscrew them and really just dive down deep into them. I prefer to not void warranties when I buy something or or, uh, use something at work, I will just simply use it until it malfunctions, then I will take it apart unless there's a service center somewhere very close and I know I'm going to get it back very quickly. Unless, of course, it's a very high price item, in which case I need to send it back and then I will make sure I have a backup before I do. But I am getting way off topic here. The reason why I don't normally do more product reviews is because I spend so much time doing them. I actually have a 60 plus hour work week. Plus I do have a commute to and from work, which is about an hour on a good day. Um, the show I'm currently working on also works me a lot at night. And by the time I come home, I am pretty tired because if I'm working overnight, I do require more sleep. If I'm working during the day, I can be fine off of you know, three to five hours of sleep and I'm perfectly fine. But if I'm working overnight, I do need about seven hours. So I don't really understand that. I guess it's because I'm flipping my biological clock upside down, biological clock, whatever the, the time thing is that your, your body goes by, your time clock, what internal time clock, whatever the thing's called. I guess that's why I just, I, you know, I don't then on the weekends flip my body around very easily. So if I'm working overnights and I get home at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning and I can only sleep until about 11 or so because it's time to start the day, that doesn't give me a whole lot of sleep to play catch up on working the overnight shift. Now, I'm not really talking a whole lot about the review process. So let me get into that a little bit, too. If I had a wonderful voice like Mike Delgadio, who could literally gargle salt water and people would love love his channel and listen to him, 
because he has that kind of a voice. His voice is absolutely amazing. He could sound great on an electric toothbrush. Me, I'm not blessed with that kind of technique on my voice. I'm just a simple guy who talks and I can, you know, I've been told my entire life that I must love hearing the sound of my voice because I just blab too much. Well, there may be some truth in that. But what I will say about this is that I don't have any abilities other than being able to test gear in many multiple different ways. I cannot play a guitar like Banjo over at Podcastage. People have even asked me, why don't you sing into a microphone? Why don't you play a guitar, play an instrument or something in there? Show us what it sounds like going into this. Dude, you do not want me to even try that stuff. If you heard the sounds that come out of my mouth when I try to sing, dude, no. You, you're talking about something that people be reporting me for on YouTube. I'd get three strikes really quickly for abuse of people that are watching the, the channel. I mean, uh, that, that is not anything I wish upon any soul on this planet. Not even the people I hate the most would I want, wish them to hear my voice uh, when I'm singing. As for playing the guitar, I played the guitar as a child, and I was bad at it then. You do not want to hear someone who has stepped completely away from that entire world for over 20 years. What do I play? The record player, MP3 players, and CD players. That's the extent of what I play now. And I think it should stay that way. Now, what I can do in my reviews is I can take microphones out into the real world, take them over my head, talk into them, vamp into them. And so that way you hear how it sounds at various different environments. I'm not the least bit scared of standing on the side of the interstate, taking a microphone, you know, 18, 20 feet overhead. I don't care about that. I can easily do that because I have many, many booms, nine total that I can take over my head and let you listen to them. I'm not scared of mounting up multiple different microphones in many different uh, environments like that. As for doing reviews and products of things inside here, I find it very difficult in my studio to do any kind of ear headphones, anything like that. Now, I have done the Trex Titanium um, uh, Aftershocks. I have done the Bose uh, Soundware Companion, things like that. But what I have not done is headphone. Well, I guess I did do the Audio Technica ATH M50X headphones. And I do, let the truth be known, have some IEMs that uh, I'm going to be doing very soon. But those are made by Bubblebee and they have a sp very specialized purpose. And the reason I don't get into headphones much is because it is so difficult to share with you the experience of them. And everybody's listening is different. I, in a different episode of the podcast, I did go over why I think reviewing uh, headphones on YouTube is completely pointless, not just because you can't hear the experience, but because what am I supposed to do? Tell you how it sounds and have you believe me? What if the way I sound, you know, in my headphones, in the way I listen to something is not the way you like something to sound. I personally like very flat microphones. I love my DPA 4017B. It's my favorite microphone. I love the 4018B, which is what I was using for the first part of this podcast when you could see me on the screen. Now I'm not using it. I'm using something else. By the way, what do you think of the way this sounds? I'm doing a different mic technique um, for this part because you're not seeing me here. I can have a microphone in my face and it's not going to drive me crazy because I'm not on camera. But whenever I review a product, I try to make sure that I review it very consistently, evenly, and fairly. I want it to be something that hopefully will tell you how that product actually is and works and what it actually is if you were to buy it and what you can expect. Some people will have told me in the past, I think you got a dud. Some people have said, oh, wow, that really changes what it is. You're the only person I've ever seen that have done a review that have said that particular thing. Well, I'll tell you this. There are people in much bigger channels that have gone to my channel and looked for opinions or people have not voiced an opinion about a product until I've gotten my hands on it and then their reviews and their uh, opinions of it follow mine. Now, I cannot say I've done the same thing. I have watched other channels, but usually if I watch any review of a product before I reviewed it myself, it's a very low volume and... I usually haven't watched very much of it at all. I'll simply just look at it enough to see if their um, 
when they do an unboxing, if it's the same kind of thing that I've, that I received because if the boxing changed anything like that, then I would want to know because, you know, the audience may expect something to be like, oh, uh, you, you expect to get this shock mount with it. If you expect to get a certain windscreen or something, and suddenly their product changes and it's no longer that way. I would want to be able to tell my audience that. Um, there's also tests that I do completely off camera that you don't see. One of the things I usually will do with a, a microphone that I'm testing is I'll wrap it up in a Fernie, a Fernie pad or a moving blanket, whatever you want to call it. And I will wrap it up very, very tightly. I'll throw it, um, you know, in a very quiet room and I will record it while I go to work. So I will have like a 16, you know, 17 hour long wave file of that microphone that I'm just that I've been recording the noise for of. And the reason why is because I'll go into my post program, my my DAW Reaper, and I will boost that level like crazy. And then I will look at the waveforms. And anytime I see something, I'll listen to it to see if it fluctuates in voltage to see if there's something happens because sometimes microphones, if they're not made properly, they will glitch and they will suddenly have a noise fluctuation, or they will pick up something or not pick up something. Um, they'll pick up RF, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that can affect a microphone. And so that's one of the tests that I will do off camera and not once so far have I reviewed a microphone that has had that issue. Um, but so, so I don't even bother reporting it, but there are tests that I will do that you never see just to make sure things are consistent. I don't find personally it to be a valuable test unless you hear it in the real world. I love taking a microphone out, putting it over my, my over my head. If it's a shotgun microphone, I should say, and letting you hear how it sounds in a real world environment. I'll go into noisy environments, quiet environments, usually very troublesome in tough fire environments. Cause if it's a controlled environment and it's acoustically treated and everything, and I can get the microphone close, then what's the point? I mean, you know, a microphone is going to sound uh, pretty decent there. If you, if it sounds good farther away too. So I'll usually go into very challenging environments when I test those kind of things. But I also am testing other products as well. There are things that I feel really bad that I've, I've sat on this ambient uh, dipstick, which is a, a, it's an articulated boom segment. I'll be reviewing that very soon, but I've been sitting on that for two years and not because it's not a good product. Ambient sent it to me at the beginning of 2000. Uh, 18 and they wanted me to, to do a review and, and talk about how to use it and how to configure it. And I helped them figure out a couple of um, issues that they've actually had with it. Not, not so much issues with the product itself, but how to make it usable for a boom operator in certain circumstances. I came up with solutions on that real quickly and they're like, holy crap, that's brilliant. Why didn't we think of that? And I can't wait to share them with you. But the reason I haven't done the review of that product yet is because every time I've started to do it, I've used, first of all, you don't use them often, but when you use them, it's really a cool thing. And I've used it quite often, but every time I get ready to do the review, I'm like, wait a minute, I just got through finding another great purpose for it. So I've done that pretty much for the past two years. But at this point, I really just need to review it because I'm so sorry to Ambient for having sat on it for so long, but it is part of my regular Boom Caddy. And this is just one example of a product that I just can't get the review done of because it's just too versatile of a product. And how do I do it without completely boring my audience and everything? I'm just going to go through and make a list of a whole bunch of things that you could use it for and then show a few examples of it. So that's at least something to look forward to. But the reason I find to, to you know, now that I've, I've blabbed on for, you know, 13, 14 minutes, the reason why I find reviews so difficult is because my voice is not great when I speak into a microphone. You cannot hear anything I'm listening to. So headphone type reviews are usually pretty pointless unless they're a specialized product. And if you expect me to play any instrument or do any kind of amusement or entertainment, I can't do that because I'm not. I mean, the best I can do is, is bring my personality to the microphone and hope that you don't click off the channel. So there you go. That's why I don't do more product reviews. That and the fact that I usually will tear something apart um, and and use it quite to death. And I just will end up finding that there's just too much to say about it. And people will be like, geez, this is so boring. I don't care about that one particular type of screw and whether it's galvanized or not. What I do care about is the, you know, anyway, you get the idea. So why don't we move on to the next segment? 
wrong answers only, or I should say not going forward. It's not, nor am I going to be doing it in this episode because it is my least well-performing segment. People usually, according to my metrics, will click off of the wrong answers only segment, zap ahead to the next segment, and then reconvene if they don't completely skip out and just, you know, leave the episode altogether. It is my least good performing segment, so I'm not going to be continuing it, probably because it is not information that anyone really cares about. There's no sound advice. There's no anything funny. I mean, aside from me trying to mislead the audience by saying the most random and bizarre things. I mean, if you want to hear misinformation, there's other YouTube channels for that, right? I mean, you don't need to hear a sound pro tell you exactly not how to do something. It's not really a funny thing, I guess, for some people. It seemed like a good idea when I started it, but it ended up not playing out nearly as well. So what I'm going to be doing in this video or rather audio at this point, is I'm gonna be telling two stories. And the first one is gonna be from about 22, 23 years ago, back when I was a, a videographer. I worked for a company right out of high school. I was hired to be the right-hand man. The title was production assistant, but that was because I was his assistant. It was the right-hand man job of a video production company. I was his editor, I was his shooter, I shoot on the weekends. He could send me out into an environment and even though I was 18 years old, I was extremely trainable, which is one reason he hired me because he really liked that about me. And I could be sent into any environment, I will make a customer happy and I would get the job done. And that's what, something that he really counted on me to do. Well, one of the things we'd specialized in was higher end weddings. So I would go out and for the video taping of the actual wedding, we would throw wireless mics out, sometimes on the groom, sometimes on the, I mean, very seldomly on the bride, but usually on the groom and or the pastor. We would also record that live and I would mix it live into the camera that I would also be operating. And then we would have other cameras out there, sometimes with another camera operator that would come out and just operate it with the company. He would operate it during the um the uh, the um, ceremony and then leave and I would cover the reception because the ceremony would require multiple cameras and the reception was something that I could handle. But when it got to the reception, it was a different beast because usually well, one of the things we'd have to do as a videographer is we'd have to coordinate with the photographer. I'd buddy buddy up and say, if I know that we're about to do a cutting of the cake or something, I'll let you know and vice versa, please. And I would make sure that that I stayed very close to the photographer as well as the DJ or MC band, whoever it happened to be, because I don't want to end up being in another room, grabbing something to eat, going to the bathroom, any of that kind of stuff, changing up batteries when they suddenly start the introduction of the bridal party, or when they just got through uh, announcing that they're doing the first dance, or they're doing the cutting of the cake, or the calling all the brides together for the, uh, the garter toss, any of that kind of stuff. I got to be in the room. I got to be recording. So I'd have to buddy buddy up with these guys so I would know exactly when they're going to be doing it. And this pertains to an interaction I had with the band. There was a new event hall that opened up. I guess it was in 1997, so 23 years now. And it they, it, they basically had this upstairs room. It was a, a restaurant down below, but upstairs there was an event hall. And it had a three and a half or four foot tall stage at one end. So you can imagine it was like an auditorium, you know, in a cafeteria at like a high school or something. So it had a, an elevated stand stage on one side and the band was set up there. So the person who was the MC would come out and stand out over everybody. And it was really a cool environment and set up. Now, he was bragging at the very beginning as they were setting up that they just got through spending a bunch of money on this brand new Bose sound system. It was a, a really awesome PA speaker system that was... At the time, it was like the system that everybody went for if you bought Bose. And a lot of people were buying Bose if they didn't go for EAW, JBL, Community, um, OAP, which is what I had, Serwin Vegas, those kind of things, Black Widow series, whatever those happened to be at the time. The, the, the Bose were very popular because people know that brand. And when you bought it, there was like, it was like eight little miniature speakers. I think it was like two high by four wide. And it was usually covered over with something that had two ports out the front. And that was what they would put up on top of stands. And they had those, but then they also had the subwoofers, which were a lot of money something like $1,500 a piece or something like that, if memory serves, but I'm probably off in that. But what I do remember is that the guy was bragging about him. Now, it was not 
one of those things that it looked like a typical speaker. The way these subwoofers were, and if you happen to know 90s gear, you know someone that does, I would love to know the model number because I would it would just totally make this awesome. And if someone's ever told me what it is after this and they hear this, please write it in the comments below. I would love to be able to add it to the description because it was hilarious what happened. They had these subwoofers, and these subwoofers, for whatever ingenious reason, Bose decided to make a speaker that looked like, I guess you could almost say like a cone. Uh from the top like if it was not flat across the top if you put something on there like a marble it would roll into the center and in the center it had a port that dropped down into the speaker itself so this thing would collect dust it would collect anything and because they put these subwoofers on the ground floor where it would shake the ground and not be up on the elevated uh, platform because they put it on the ground floor where it would do the best amount of bass response for the room it was one of those things that people happen to always put beers on. Now, at that particular event hall, they also had these little pillars that were about four feet tall that people would also that, – that they usually put flowers or something on. And people would also always put their beer around the, um, the, the flower vases up there. And then they would get out on the dance floor. They'd dance, do whatever else, and usually reach over, grab the, the beer, take a sip, and put it back. Well – for whatever crazy reason, they put the speaker right underneath one of those pillars. And as I was going around videotaping everything, now I'm not the kind of guy that would just stand back and zoom in and see people. I was one of those that back in the 90s, if you recall, there was a technique that you could use on a camera called shaky cam, where you would run out, throw a camera and, and kind of, you know, you know, tilt the angle a little bit, dutch it left. You'd step back and at the same time, you'd dutch it back to the right. It was very active and flowy. And I was also able to do techniques like I could snap zoom in on somebody across the room and then the cameras that we had were, were good enough that you could actually um, zoom in. And then what I would do is I would walk towards them while zooming out fairly quickly. And it kind of had that Jaws type effect where the person stayed the same frame size in the shot. But all of a sudden I could like wrap around them real quick and you're like, whoa, the camera just snapped, zoomed in, and now it's right on them and moving around. That was really a cool thing. And usually I was really good at just rock on a dance floor, going around, seeing everybody, how it worked. People never got sick. And my my boss, the, the guy in charge of the production company, was always showcasing my work when he was selling customers. And a lot of the times they would say, I want whoever shot this because it was it looked that good. It was that that active. And and you know, I made the guy a lot of money. I did my job well. The reason I'm mentioning this is because I was extremely active on the dance floor, not always paying attention to what was behind me, even though people would realize real quickly, they would see my style and they would stay away from me. I was able to, you know, rush someplace. I would usually, you know, glance over my shoulder and see where I was. And I would look for people by, by snapping my eyes back in either direction, you know, left or right, depending on where I wanted to go. There were also certain moves that I would do where I would know spatially where there was somebody to my side. If I stepped backwards, I'd have to glance over my shoulder and verify that. Now, I stepped back at this particular event hall into one of those pillars, and a beer happened to fall into one of those speakers, and it completely drained into this, the top port of that speaker, sizzled it out, and fried the speaker. Now, I didn't know all this until about 15 or so seconds after I, you know, stepped back into it. I felt, you know, I was like, okay, that wasn't a person. That was one of those pillars. I didn't notice anything fell. And then after I got my shot, they changed the song, and I was like, okay, well, um, you know, let me go ahead and, you know, step away. So I cut the, the camera because it had been like 15 minutes that I was recording. And I glanced down and I realized that when I stepped back into that pillar, I knocked over one of those beers and it had just completely drained and funneled directly into that subwoofer. And that thing was making all kinds of distorted sounds and it died. Now, at the end of the night, I was going to go and talk to the, the to the band and uh, admit to everything and let him know what all happened. And that was willing to cover it because chances are beer was not going to be covered. And so at the end of the night, I went and talked to the band. And the guy was looking at the speaker and he was like, holy crap, look what happened here. This is terrible. 
oh man, I don't know what happened, but you know what? He kind of he he kind of just yelled out to the room. He said, you know what though? That's what happens in these kind of events. And uh, I don't know who did this or anything, but it's one of those things where I consider this to be something that happens. And it was a learning experience. And I found this to be one of those things that even though this subwoofer is is shot and I got to get it repaired, I think this was a learning experience. And we really need to learn that this was not the right kind of speaker we needed to get. And so I said, I said, I know what happened. He said, I don't even want to know, man. I don't even want to know. I think it was, it was meant to be. And he was one of those kind of guys. I was like, okay, so that's fine. I won't tell him I backed into the pillar and knocked an entire beer into his speaker and sizzled the thing out. Who knows how much that subwoofer was and how much it cost to repair if it wasn't covered by warranty, which I doubt it was, but the dude did not want to know. He just had one of those kind of, yo, man, this is like one of those fate things. And um, yeah, great. So the second story I'm going to tell you was back in another life, I worked at a company called Earthlink. And I'm sure you're familiar with Earthlink. Now, I worked there right after Earthlink burged with Mindspring. So Mindspring had a very much old school kind of, you know, a homey, uh, people would call up in the middle of the night and someone would tech your, they would tech your printer because they were all, you know, tech geeks. And if there was nothing wrong with the system and they had nothing else going on, they'd go ahead and tech your printer. They'd go ahead and tech your VPN or whatever. They did not care. When Earthling took over, they were a lot more corporate. I mean, what do you expect? It's California coming in and merging with a Georgia boy company. So that's one of the things that, that happened is Earthling brought their, um, corporate uh corporateness to it and the company became earthlink but mindsprings call centers still had a lot of legacy mindspring technicians there the company was also very lax regarding dress code they said that you that you know if you're working in a call center it doesn't matter what it is just dress in whatever you wanted to well at the time i was training uh to be um you know, uh, I was training to be a first degree black belt in Taekwondo. And, uh, for example, so, uh, since my hours there meant that if I had to go by my house or I even had to change clothes before leaving at the end of my shift, I would not make it to class in time. And if I made it late, I was not allowed to, to go in. Uh, they would hold me there, uh, because they, they would just go ahead and start the class. And I did not want to miss any of that. So I would, on the days I was going to go to class, I would wear my martial art outfit. And so when I was a brown belt, it was one of those things where it was kind of funny that people would just kind of glance at you and then be like, okay, but as soon as I became a black belt, suddenly people would open doors for me. I would be walking towards a door and they look at me and it's, they'd be like, oh, okay. And they would open the door and, and, you know, nod or smile or something like that. It's like, dude, I was like a, a first scoop brown belt and you didn't care anything, but oh, black belt, you obviously need to have, uh, you know, the black belt in order to get some sort of respect as a martial artist. Well, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked yet again, because that's what I'm great at is sidetracking things. When I was at Earthlink though, I, after I earned my, my, my black belt, I was working on my second degree and the company I was working for invited me to work for them full time. So I said, you know what, I'm going to leave my, my job here at Earthlink and I'm going to go and and work for, uh, the, the martial art company I went to work for. I'm not going to name them, but I had a last call at Earthlink and it was a quite phenomenal one. Now, at this point in time, I was an Escalate technician. I was a senior level technician. I was the team mentor. I was high, you know, I, I had great metrics. My, my team supervisors would usually dial in on me and have me take irate calls. And, you know, someone calls up and they're really furious that their DSL has been down for a month and a half and they're just about to cancel. They'd send them to me and say, Alan, you fix this make the customer happy. Now I would do that. And I was ex I was excelled at these very difficult calls. And one of the abilities that I've naturally had is the ability to troubleshoot something really quickly and getting those results while ensuring confidence with the customer. Well, my very last call with Earthlink was as follows. I knew that my shift was going to end at 7 a.m. Because at that point I was on a power shift. It was uh, Sunday, Monday, and then they skipped Tuesday and I was Wednesday, Thursday, what they called a power. No, it was Saturday, Sunday, 
Tuesday, Wednesday power shift. I don't remember what it was. I, I can't remember. But what I do remember is a power shift was a 10 hour shift. I would go to work for about two and a half hours. I would have a 15 minute break. I'd go back for two hours, have a 15 minute break. I'd go back for an hour and 45 minutes. I'd have a uh, an, an hour lunch, which I hated the hour lunch, but that was what they gave you on a power shift. And then I'd come back for two more hours. So actually the last wave was an hour and a half. So whatever it worked out to be, uh, maybe it was two hours after my last break before lunch. But what I remember is that my shift ended at 7 a.m. It was 8 p.m. to 7 a.m. And my very last call that came in, I was so excited to be helping customer after customer after customer. And I was thinking, this is going to be my last call because in the middle of the night, the phone slowed down a lot. And I knew that when the phone rang at about 6.25 a.m., it was going to be the last call that came in. Now, the call came in, and the lady was having some severe issues with her DSL. It had been a long time since it had worked, and she was at wit's end. She was like, this, I, you know, I've talked to multiple techs and none of them seem to know what's going on or how to do this. And I, I look, I knew instantly what the problem was. The problem was that she needed what was called a, 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 a trouble ticket, a UTT. We would have to do a trouble ticket, turn it into the knock and the knock would fix it on their end. And I knew this the second she started talking about this and I looked through her notes, but unfortunately, if you do a UTT, it's one of those things where you would normally, if you were a better technician, you'd give them your name and your number and you'd invite them to call you back what, if it was not resolved in 24 hours. And I was one of those techs that always did that. Being that this was my last call, I was not going to be able to do that. I also changed my voicemail every single day. So that way it would say for this date, leave me a voicemail message and I'm in the office today. And at the end of my shift, I would say, I'm going to be off and, and I return to the office at this date and at this time. So that way, if someone called me, they would hear that and they would know to leave me a voicemail message or call the regular queue if they couldn't wait that long. But I was very, very much customer focused and, and did that. Now, one of the reasons I'm mentioning that is because I was fully expecting this customer to be fine with my technique on this. I said, Yes, ma'am. I actually know exactly what the problem was. And while, while she was telling me the issue real quick, I hit mute on the phone and Todd was the next technician over. He, he was, he started the company at the same time as me. He had, you know, many of the same skills. His, um, people skills were spot on. He could have easily handled this call. And I said, Hey Todd, I got someone that I need. She's going to have a UTT, but she needs to actually talk to you again, most likely to verify. Do you mind if I pass the call over to you? Uh, so that way you could walk her to through to resolution because she's had some trouble. He's like, no, absolutely send her on over. So when uh, she finally stopped talking for a split second, I said, yes, ma'am. Now I'm going to, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to transfer you to someone that's going to be able to help you fully. And she's like, no, 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 please don't, please don't. I said, ma'am, let, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. I am being completely honest with you. This is my last call at Earthling. My shift ends very soon, and I put in a resignation two weeks ago. This is my last call because my shift is literally going to be ending about the time we get off the phone. And I know what you need to have, and I've started the process now, but I need to transfer the call to someone who's in the next cube over, and he will walk you through to resolution. He's going to give you his name and his number and let you fully – you know, help, you know, and he's going to make sure you are fully set up and, and ready to go. And based on this UTT that I'm going to fill out, it should only be about 24 to maybe 36 hours to get this resolved. And I hope it doesn't take anything more than that, but he's going to be there with you. Uh, his name is Todd. And if you don't mind, I'm going to transfer you over to him right now. And he's going to tech you and walk with you through to completion. How does that sound? She said, if you didn't want to help me, I wish you wouldn't have wasted my time to begin with. And she hangs up. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let this be my last call here at Earthlink. Quickly, I saw her number on the screen and I tried calling her back. She did not answer. I transferred, I gave her information to Todd and I said, Todd, could you please call her, get her on the phone and resolve this. And her phone was off the hook. This was back in the landline days. This was back in the early 2000s. 
And she had taken her phone off the hook, did not want to deal with it because I guess she, she knew that when her phone rang right after she hung up on me, she did not want that to ring again because I guess it was early enough that she didn't want the household to wake up or something. So she took her phone off the hook. My last call at Earthlink was a customer that hung up on me and did not want me to resolve it. That's been one of those things that I have thought about so many times and I regret that so badly. That lady, I feel so bad for. <sighs> I hate that. I wish I could have fixed her. Floating. Well, I agreed to do 10 episodes of the podcast and then see how that goes. And I have completed all 10 of those episodes. And here's what I will say. There are some segments that do better than others. And there are some things about the podcast that people like. And there's some things that people aren't seeming to really get a whole lot of. I also do know that it's extremely difficult to produce these episodes on a weekly basis because I just don't have that many hours in the week. And doing the nine episodes that I did on a weekly basis for two months was extremely difficult. It cut back on my sleep a lot. And my regular sound speeds release schedule, it was almost as difficult to me. And I say almost because at the very beginning, when I started the channel, I was doing one video every three days, and I agreed to do that for the first 100 episodes. So if you go back and look at a lot of my videos early on in the, in the life of sound speeds, most of my videos were very, very short, two to four minutes. But over the course of time, people wanted me to just dive deeper and really just analyze and tear through uh, something educational-wise and fully in investigate it and really just teach the whole thing. So I started doing that as opposed to little tidbits of knowledge. Also at the time, Matt Price over at his uh, YouTube channel, Sound Rolling, he was doing a lot of little tidbits, short segments, and he would just kind of turn a camera upon himself and feel inspired to show something. And he would go over that and then hit cut and uh, a stop on the camera. And then he would upload it to YouTube. Well, my videos have always been a different format. They've always been rehearsed. They've been kind of, I don't want to say scripted because they've never really been that, but they have been very prepared and I've gone out and shot some footage. And then sometimes I've done, you know, edits where I've, I've gone crazy and really just don't dive deep into a subject and really just torn it shreds. There's been other times that I've just given my information. That's a lot of the way the 3BO series is. It's based on a lot of my uh, classroom content that I have when I teach boom operator classes. But the reason why I'm going into all this is because the podcast going forward, if it continues at all, which I don't know if it's going to or not, is going to be sound based only. I may occasionally do a video segment, and that would be because I am still continuing this podcast on YouTube. It's going to follow the same way these last few segments have been, where you see my logo on the screen and it disappears at the end of the segment. That way, if you do have a desire to fast forward through it, you know when it's going to completely vanish. Um, that's at the end of the segment. So that way you know where it's going to be and how it's going to end. Now, as we move forward, I'm going to be looking at the metrics and how this episode does too, because, you know, I have seen how that, how it slowly growed, grown over the course of the nine episodes. And then I gave it a good few, I was going to give it originally like two weeks and then do the last episode, but then that put me right in the middle of Thanksgiving break. And I was out of town. I was at Disney for Thanksgiving and I didn't want to produce an episode and have it, you know, be phoned in. And there was, there was a, um, a review of like the road in TG five that I really wanted to do. And then there was some other things I really wanted to do. And those were going to take more time anyway, in order to do those correctly. And on a constant release schedule, I could not do the podcast. And that's one thing that's also been very difficult is producing video podcast content. I don't know how people do it on a regular basis. If they work a regular day job as well, it's extremely difficult to do. And so going forward, I'm going to concentrate on doing a shorter podcast, not as many segments. It's not going to have the six segments that we've done the video podcast with. It's probably going to have a different format to it. Most likely, I'll still stick with story time and I'll still probably have some sort of a floating segment. It may be three segments long. It may just be two. But what I have found is that story time is probably one of my most uh, popular uh, segments. I guess people like to hear the stories. And uh, floating is one that people have actually come back for also. Uh, opinionated much is also a, a pretty consistent one too. 
But from the very beginning with uh, Amazon Impulse Buys and the Something Sound segments, after those, usually um, the the number of views kind of wavers and it goes down a little bit starting at the very beginning and it slowly starts to kind of taper off. But you could see where it would level out in views and time watched over the course of the segments. People would stay and watch and then they would completely drop away almost at uh, the wrong answers only segment and then they would come back for the story time. And then they would also usually stay for floating. But it really, those segments were all kind of about the same. So what I'll probably do if I come back and do some sort of a, a voice only podcast is I will end up doing it, sending it to a podcaster, um, some sort of a software. I'll probably, uh, you know, have Banjo over at podcast, uh, send me yet again, the video that he made on how to do a podcast. And I'll probably ask him 5,000 questions and uh, get it set up. So that way, if you wanted to listen on your phone or listen at work or something like that, you'd be able to listen to the podcast, but it's not going to be in the same current format that it currently is. Thank you very much for your support. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And for this episode, episode 10 for new year's day, 2020, that's it for this podcast. I really appreciate you listening and we'll see what the future is going to be in the comments below. Please tell me what you thought of these 10 episodes, because that's yet another thing I will say is that nobody has, has asked me if I was coming back and doing an, a 10th episode. People didn't really seem to ask, you know, if I'm coming back. So I'll have to see if I want to come back. And if I do, maybe it's not going to be sound related at all. Maybe it could be a totally different thing, but for right now, that's it for this podcast. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Take care. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.